Thanks everybody for being here with me today. Um, when Wi-Fi is not enough is really just like a collection of the ideas that I've used to help me during the pandemic um, to help people on computers. And it's also, there are also things in there that even though I have not used them yet, I know they're available in the event that I should need them. So about six months ago, I returned from furlough um, and the library was really a different place. Probably the most noticeable thing is that we had gone from being amongst the people and really meeting them where they are to kind of being in this plexiglass fortress and surrounded by like these really cute little cactuses. So I've always been the type of person to ask how can I or what might it take to accomplish something. Um, so when the first customer approached me and approached the desk asking for help on a computer, I made the decision to leave the fortress. I was confident in my ability to help them and I had a plan. I was just gonna stand really far back, project my voice. I wasn't even worried about seeing their screen. About five minutes into that though, I knew I had messed up because all the customers nearby were kind of giving us dirty looks and rolling their eyes. They didn't really say anything because they remembered me and they knew that I'd probably help them with something similar before the pandemic. But all those looks kind of made the person that I was helping uncomfortable and nervous. And I realized that I actually, you normally got super close to people and gave them lots of really hands-on help before the pandemic. After that experience, I was really ready to just stand on my right to just stay within the fortress. But what got me out of that mindset was really when one of my regulars came in and it was somebody who, when I first met them two or three years ago, I actually had to stop them from throwing their new tablet in the trash can. So when that person walked up and asked me for help, I knew how far they had come with technology because they really wanted to learn and they needed it to improve their quality of life. They had gotten so far as to be able to independently log onto a computer, open up Excel, type in information and start the forwarding and start the formatting process on their own because a librarian had helped them to grow. So if I didn't have the heart to refuse to help, I knew I needed to figure out a way to make helping from a safe distance easier. So today I have data that will help us all to see that we are not alone in this struggle. The thought process that I use when I'm helping people with technology and some tech tips and little maker inventions that if you don't find them helpful, you will at least find them amusing. So I downloaded data from the IMLS website, and this is, will be their 2018 survey data. I got the data for um, the, United, the entire United States for public libraries, and then also our four states. The central service that I would say that libraries provide will be in communication and technology. So every day in libraries in the United States, we are seeing about 1 million or over 1 million Wi-Fi sessions and over 600,000 computer use sessions. If we bring that a little closer to home to our region within our four states, we're making up about 11% of those computer use sessions per day and 5% of those Wi-Fi sessions. What made this information a little bit more interesting is that our region only makes up at what we have about 280 libraries between our four states and that only makes up about three percent of libraries in the country yet we have 11 percent of the computer use sessions and five percent of the wi-fi session i think our our true service and and what makes what we do really important is that we make technology equitable for everyone so I didn't just wanna look at my library, but I didn't have enough time to do a really large scale survey or study. 
So I asked eight libraries, so one li or two libraries from each of our states about what they were doing to help people with technology or what they had been doing. I chose to request the 2019 data because I figured anything from 2020 would probably be skewed because of the pandemic. So of the libraries that offer classes, they were doing about 261 of those a year and usually getting about six people per class. So over a course of a year, that would be well over a thousand people. And those classes occasionally were things that were as advanced as 3D printing, but most of the time it was something more focused on basic navigation, using a mouse or work for workforce development type skills. And libraries that offer private tech help sessions, which is something like my library does in here in Virginia in Chesterfield, we're getting about 19 sessions per week. And those sessions usually last about half an hour. Something else that was I found to be interesting is that of all private appointments that librarians make and the things they, they help people with, technology sessions tended to be very high in number. So that took up about 57% of all the private appointments. So this is probably the big question that I've heard a lot is everybody wants to know who's open. So the data I have here is even though most of the time being open and computer access was the same, the data that I have here really focuses on if a person could use a computer. So in some cases, that may mean that a library was open, but they did not allow computer access. So in this chart, I would have marked that library as closed. If the library was closed, but they allowed appointments for computer access, then I marked them as open. So if we go back a little bit, back to 2020, at the onset of the pandemic, the ALA did a survey of all libraries. So they included public libraries, academic libraries, K through 12, everybody. Um, and they did that in May of 2020. And from the information they were able to gather, there were about 12% of libraries open to an extent that might allow computer access. We come back to, you know, a year later to 2021, as of Monday of last week, these are the libraries, or this is the percentage of libraries that are open in each of our states. We can see that in South Carolina, um, it's about 95% open. And in here in Virginia, it's about 66% 66 open. And I got this data by downloading um, a list of libraries from the IMLS website, and then going to each of their websites and seeing what type of notices they had posted. So you see the little tags there um, on the open percentages. That's because being open usually came with the catch. So a lot of the libraries would also have a notice on their website saying that the time limits were different than they normally would be. So you might get a time limit of anywhere from 30 minutes to two hours. And then they might have something saying that they weren't offering any computer assistance at all. They may also require appointments, so you couldn't just walk in and start using a computer. And a lot of this, a lot of libraries may note that they had far fewer computers than they had before the pandemic because they needed to space out those workstations um, to allow for social distancing. So the takeaways that you're gonna get today are really gonna be um, the questions that I use to manage perspective when helping people, the language that I use kind of the, the spoken language, but also maybe even body language to get like that five-star customer service rating and some technology tips. So understanding perspective, before we even get into anything else, I think it's really important to have an understanding of the role perspective plays in helping people with technology. So 
perspective has pretty much two definitions. There's as it relates to sight and there's as it relates to the brain. So even in sight, it's based on what we see, but depending on where we're standing or maybe if we need glasses or not, we may all see something different. And as far as it goes to the brain, it might be just the person's current mental state or it could be something that has happened to them in the past or something that they're going through right now that might affect the way they perceive things. So the three questions I use to help me really manage perspective would be the first thing, and I know we all ask this when we first walk up, is how can I help? And what that does is that allows me to establish my perspective in how to best help that customer and my thinking and line of thought of what's going on. But it also gives that customer to a chance to explain their perspective. And obviously the customer doesn't say, hey, this is my perspective, this is what's going on. But I pick up on a lot of what they're saying and how they're feeling based on how they explain what they need. It could be something as simple as if they seem excited or frustrated already, or something more along the lines of, what type of terminology do they use to describe their need? The next question that pretty much is me leading them through the process of getting help is, do you see? So that might sound like, you know, do you see the compose button or do you see the link on the bottom right of the screen? And that's me just taking my perspective and walking them through what I think is the best path for them to follow to complete the task that they need. The third question, which I would say before the pandemic, I really never had to use except when I was helping someone on the phone, will be, what do you see? So this kind of flips the table and puts the customer in the role of leading from their perspective. And then I'm just pointing out the important things along the path. So that might sound like them saying, you know, I see this little icon, looks like a girl with a bun. And then I would tell them, you know, oh yeah, okay, that's, that's Libby, that's the one you want. You want to click on that button. So to get these really good customer service ratings and have customers leaving thinking like I'm an angel and bragging about me everywhere, I try to focus on action-based compassion and showing confidence without making promises. And to do that, that might sound like um, well, first, eliminating weak language. So I don't usually walk up to a customer saying something like, I think, or I don't know. Um, I will walk up to them, even if they're asking me with something that I've never worked with before, you might say something like, I've used Microsoft Word, perhaps Google Docs is similar. Let's have a look at it. And for action-based compassion, it's just showing the customer that you care. So, and, and want them to complete their goal. So what that looks like for me is if I spend, you know, a, a certain amount of time helping a customer learn how to do something, you know, format a resume in Word or actually just getting that information into Word in the first place or getting started filling out parts of a job application, then I might notice while I'm helping them, you know, hey, they only have five minutes left on this computer. That's not enough time to actually complete what they wanted to do. So I would let them know I'm gonna extend their time. Or in the case where it's something where I absolutely cannot help them, it might be just showing them that I really care by documenting the issue and letting them know that I will report it to our IT department. That way, even though they, it can't help them today, maybe if they come in tomorrow or next week, that issue might be resolved so that they can complete what they need. I used to think of helping customers to really make them happy and get that good customer service feedback. I used to think that it was in large part about speed and competence. And that's pretty much the order I used to try to work in, being really quick and knowing as much as possible and not necessarily worrying about feeling so much. But what I found over time is that you really get the best customer service. You have the best experiences when you mix that confidence without promise and then that action-based compassion because that usually leaves the customer feeling good.
good about the experience. And it also showing that confidence without necessarily making promises that will disappoint them shows your competence. And when you have those two things, a lot of times, obviously, they don't want to wait forever for you to figure out something or to help them with something. But a lot of times, they will wait a lot longer than we think they might. So I wanted the, the, all, everything in this presentation to be super easy. I know everybody has different physical tech, maybe different permissions, um, different skill levels and different needs. So I wanted this to be something where, you know, if this is your lunch break, you can get up from your desk and go put some of this into action. Or if you have a, a free hour, you can make some of these little things and then go out and use them today. So in my research and looking at different libraries, surveying their websites and kind of seeing what I could find about what they were doing to help people on computers during the pandemic, probably the most advertised services I could find would be libraries using Zoom and libraries using TeamViewer. We have a lot of options when it comes to both of the services those provide. So that's why I broke them down into methods. So the method, the Zoom method would be screen sharing and a video chat. And then the team viewer method would be remote access and phone calls. With each of those things, obviously when we go into screen sharing, a lot of times those services will be free and customers may already be using them. So if we look at something like Google Meet, a lot of customers may already have a Gmail account. So they can just log in and click on Google Meet and then screen share with you from there. Um, if we hop over to something like TeamViewer, um, I would say, though all of these are usually free to try, a lot of times when you get into remote access software, it does usually cost something at least. So in the case of TeamViewer, I believe there is a library um, in Texas called the Grand Prairie Library. They were probably the most open about using TeamViewer that I could find online. And they decided to get it on three staff computers and that cost them about 500 about five hundred dollars per staff computer for that software so it, it can get expensive it's all about just finding the right option for your budget um, parsec would be another one it's probably more developed parsec and discord actually are probably more developed from the gaming community but you can use them for anything. Um, Parsec, A Power Mirror, Team Viewer, those are all examples of things that can use remote access. Although in every case, anything that does remote access where you can actually control the customer's computer usually also has a screen sharing aspect at a lower level. Versus if we look at something like um, Google Meet and Discord, maybe click share and Microsoft is on there. I just put Microsoft because it probably has multiple applications. So we can use something like Teams maybe to screen share. But our library actually tried something called Remote Control Viewer. It was actually an IT tool that they use for um, anything managed by our server, connected to our server, could kind of use this um, screen or this remote access software. Um, at this point, we've pretty much decided it's not necessarily the best one for us, just because a lot of times, as we, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of these sessions last um, 30 minutes or more. So um, any, a lot of times something created for IT is kind of for them to swoop in quickly and fix it, but we need something that's more uh, based in communication and gives us time to really help the customer. So probably one of the simplest things that I've used, and this has probably been the most helpful thing to me, is having people zoom in if they're using a web browser. Every web browser has that zoom in feature and it's really easy to get to. Most people will already know um, what you're talking about. Most customers knew what I was talking about, but I did start to run into more and more who kind of had trouble with getting to the point where I could help them. 
So I made um, the handout that you see there and I tried to make it as simple and as visual as possible. So they didn't even have to read it to figure out um, how to get their screen to a point that I could see it to help them. Other features that have been helpful. Um, I think most public libraries use um, Windows computers as their main public PCs. I know some probably use Macs for digital media labs, but I, I've been in libraries all around the country and I, I'm pretty sure they all use Windows. So things that might be helpful is if you type in ease of access in the search bar, you will find the menu kind of like the one you see in the middle of my screen here. And the tools that I want to point out that I think are the most useful would be um, under the display settings. If you choose make text bigger, make text bigger and make everything bigger, um, I found that that really helps customers, especially using something, say, in Microsoft Word, when they need to get to those paragraph settings. A lot of times that little tiny box in the right hand corner doesn't even look like a button or they can't see it. So making everything bigger actually makes um, buttons and menu items larger so that we can point it out if they're trying to remove that extra space or double space of paper that they're working on. The other one would be um, the magnifier tool. And that pretty much, it has different modes, but my favorite mode is to have the, um, the lens mode because that has like a little magnifying glass that follows the cursor around. So that can be helpful. Um, as far as speech recognition goes, um, and what you see in that video there is an example or a demonstration of their mouse grid feature that's part of speech recognition. So it's not just um, having the computer type what you tell it, but it can also control the computer. And what it does is it puts up a, uh, a numbered grid. So then you can say, um, as you select numbers, it puts up a smaller grid until ultimately it's in the proper position to click on something. And at that time, you would tell it to click and it would do that. And that may be something that um, you can use either having a wireless headset connected to that computer where you can stand far away, or even if you just use it to help with navigation where the customer can say, you know, mouse grid, and then you tell them, you know, look in area six, something like that. And finally, there is mouse keys under the mouse menu. And what's helpful about that is it allows customers to use the number pad or the arrows on the number pad to control the mouse. So a lot of times if um, I'm trying to help someone to find something and their, their perspective is just such that they can't see what I'm talking about and I get down to, um, giving them small directions like, you know, okay, you're, you're nearby, but just move over to the right, you know, just a smidge. And they're so nervous or wrapped up into what's going on that they probably go all the way across the screen. Something like mouse, mouse keys is helpful in those situations because um, it, the, it will only move the cursor a small amount. So you can tell them, you know, just push the right button and it'll move over to the direction where you can say, you know, now you're over it, go ahead and click. And so everybody know, just so everybody would know, um, accessibility tools is what um, all other web browsers, even phone web browsers or phone browsers, or not browsers, I'm sorry, operating systems um, is what all of them call these tools. So Windows calls it ease of access now, um, but in every other operating system, it would be called an accessibility tool. Uh, Chromebooks are probably after Windows Chromebooks are probably something we are more likely to see in libraries just because a lot of schools are using those now. So if you need help learning about what accessibility features are available for Chromebooks, they have a Google Chrome YouTube channel with a Chrome and Chrome OS accessibility playlist. Um, and I should say that all of the operating systems have some form of the tools that Windows has. They may not have the exact same ones or they may work a little different, but you should be able to find something in every operating system that is helpful. For people using a Mac, if they just go to um, apple.com slash accessibility, and it will actually explain 
all the tools that they have. And if they're using Linux, so something like Ubuntu or Mint, then um, you just go and look up the documentation for that distribution or flavor. So something that we all may be understanding now is that you know, using technology to help someone who is already having trouble with technology can be a barrier in itself. So to kind of move away from that, I came up with a few um, just physical maker ideas um, that can be helpful. So in the video there, you see me going through the process of making this screen grid. Um, it's something that we have hanging near the computer so the customer can place it on their screen when they need help and they can take it off when they don't need the help anymore. And the way I made this was that I used um, transparency film, or actually I brought up the mouse grid feature on our public computer monitors and traced that with paper. And then I was able to use that kind of trace sheet to put the transparency film over and then trace that grid onto the transparency film. For our computers, it took about three sheets of transparency film and I taped them together and then I use hanging file tabs. So most offices will have those hanging file folders. And so the tabs that you use to mark each folder are the ones that I use to make it so that these could easily hang on the computers. This can cost as much or as little as you like it to. So what you just saw in the video there was a, a version of the printed screen grid. So I actually even made one, instead of just using a marker, I made some in Microsoft Word and had them print it and ended up costing me about a dollar a page. So this can be anywhere from a zero dollar project. So, um, cause I originally, these transparency films were donated to our makerspace. So there was something that's already available to me or it can probably cost you up to $20 if you wanna have them printed, depending on what settings you select and how much work you want to do yourself. If you wanna have it bleed all the way to the edge so you don't want to do any cutting or if you want to have them laminated for you and everything. Um, I can say that lamination is definitely the way to go because what I found in using a marker to make the grid on the transparencies, even though you can you know, put the, the ink on the back so that you can still kind of wipe it off or disinfect it, alcohol is a solvent for permanent marker. So if you get alcohol on it and rub it, then you're rubbing off the ink. And in the case of the, the printed transparencies, the ink actually scratched off. So alcohol couldn't rub it off, but it would scratch off. So I would say laminating them is definitely a good idea. That way they can be disinfected and you don't have to worry about um, any ink issues. The next thing I created was a pointer. And I, when I was originally searching for a pointer, I found out that most pointers are only about three to four feet long. So they're not long enough. And then when I finally did find one that was long enough, it was $20. So I felt like that was too much money. So in the video there, you see me going through the process of making this pointer. What I did was I bought a baluster to make the handle. And those are like $1.29 and it'll be a multi-use item because you, you only need pieces of it. And then I got a six foot dowel rod um, to be the actual stick that I would use for the pointing. Uh, I knew that it would need a, something soft on the tip in case I did touch a computer screen. I didn't want to, to damage a computer screen. So I designed something for 3D printing um, and I printed it out of TPU, which is a very flexible material. That way I knew it wouldn't damage the screen if I happened to touch it. If you don't have a 3D printer, um, it's definitely not necessary. If you wanna put something on the tip, it could be as simple as a cotton ball in a piece of material stapled onto the end. You know, you really just need something soft. Uh, if you don't have 
tools, like these are pretty basic tools. So a saw and a drill and the drill bit, I would say most people who are reasonably handy would have them already. So if you don't necessarily have the tools yourself, someone you know who has tools or is reasonably handy probably has them already. Maybe even if you have a maker space in your area that is open right now, you can certainly find some form of these tools there. You don't have to have, it doesn't have to be a power tool. It could be like a regular, you know, hand, old timey hand drill or handsaw, or it might be as advanced as something like a bandsaw and an actual drill press. It doesn't matter um, about the tools you use necessarily. You just have to get the, the basics of the task done. Um, and this can be decorated anything, any way you want. If your library wants to kind of have more of a uniform look, they can definitely paint them all one color or stain them. Um, the handles, you can cover them in whatever you like. I chose to cover mine in your, yarn just because that's what I had re readily available. And I knew it was something that I could change anytime I felt like. But if you wanna, if you have, uh, a better material or just want to wrap it in even something as basic as saran wrap so that you can wipe it off, that would definitely work as well. The other thing I got to say about the pointer is that first thing I probably, the main reaction I got from staff upon first seeing it is that they were concerned they might hit someone with it. Um, I can say that it is extremely light so that you can use it with one hand. And if you want more control over it, you can extend your other hand to hold it um, on the dial rod section. And it is very sturdy. It doesn't wobble or bounce or anything. So it will go where you send it. So you don't have to worry about hitting someone. Our mobile customers, um, I didn't want to ignore them because they are significant. So according to a, a, Pew, a Pew Research study, that they did in 2019, about 81% of Americans now own a smartphone. But we know in libraries that, you know, we probably see a lot of times, we may see that 80% a lot of times, but then a lot of times we see that 19% that doesn't have the phone. So just to get an idea of what things might be like um, in our different areas, I asked some of those, that, those eight libraries I originally talked to, I asked them about, what their mobile website traffic looked like. So it went as high as in like in Georgia, the Clayton Library, they had 84% of their website visitors were using mobile devices. So that's tablets and phones, things like that. And then over here um, in Virginia, we have CCPL reported theirs as being 20% of website visitors were from mobile, mobile devices. Either way, um, um, oh, and you'll notice there isn't any for North Carolina, and that was just because the libraries that the two libraries I looked at there, they just didn't have that data available. Um, but no matter the percentage, in most cases, the number of mobile users for each library's website was very large. So averaging out just their mobile users, it came up to close to 800,000 visitors per year were using a mobile device. So the problem with helping people on the phone is just that from a logistic standpoint, it doesn't work. Because it's a handheld device, and it's, it's made to be a, something personal and close to you. The only way for you to help the customer is that they have to do kind of what this guy is doing in the picture here, extend their arm out and have the phone, the phone facing you. Well, when they do that, then they can't see the screen and then they can't operate it. And because the screen is so small, you may not be able to see the screen even though it's being extended to you. So um, phones also have all of the accessibility features that I talked about earlier. The problem with them oftentimes though is that they have a learning curve to them because they require hand gestures. And a lot of times customers are already struggling with using hand gestures to operate a phone. So in most cases, I found that the best way to help people with phones is usually to look in this area um, with the, the downloaded services. And 
use something like a power mirror or your phone. And what a power mirror, um, I think I already talked about, it's a remote access software. So um, what the customer will do is they download the app on their phone and then you'd also have the software on a computer somewhere. And then it can either only be a screen sharing software. So you can just share the screen to the computer, but it can also be used to remotely access the phone. So have the con control the phone from the computer. Um, what, what is maybe a little difficult starting out with it for the remote access portion is that the first time you try to use it um, for remote access to actually control the phone, you do have to be plugged up into that computer. Something that's a little bit simpler, but um, it also has its own catches is that um, the Your Phone app is something that came with Windows 10. So all Windows 10 computers should have it on there. And if you get the app on your phone, then it allows you to log into your, your Windows account on your phone and also on that computer. So it might be something best used if a customer came in with their own laptop. But once you're logged in um, on both of those, then you can view photos and things and operate apps from the computer instead of relying on controlling them from the phone. So in an effort to uh, get that small screen onto a bigger screen, you can see me there in the picture helping a customer with their phone. At our library, we were lucky that we already kind of had these little learning stations set up before the pandemic. And we also already had ClickShare. So that was something that was just ready, readily available and ready to go um, once all of this started happening. Um, so the customer is easily able, they just download the ClickShare app and then they're able to project to those screens. There's also, um, I would say in all cases, the mobile customer, they would need to download the app, whether it's you know the Google Meet app, the Zoom app, TeamViewer app, they would need to download the app. But from a computer standpoint, so the screen they're projecting to, it may not necessarily need to have any software installed. So like if they're using Google Meet, they might need to have the Google Meet app you know, or the Discord app. But when you go to the computer, the computer would only need to access the website because it can use the web-based version of that software. Um, things like ClickShare and 8 Power Mirror often work on the network, so you need to be connected to the same Wi-Fi network. If for any reason um, you can't get special software uh, and or something can't work over your network, then you can definitely use, go back to using, you know, old fashioned connectors. Uh, you may have to wipe them off in between customers, but you can get something like a USB-C to HDMI connector. So if you just have a monitor sitting around that's not connected to a computer, um, you can use that connector to pretty much connect that phone to the monitor as if it were a computer and display the screen from there. Obviously the customer would still need to control it um, from the phone, but you could see what they were doing to help guide them along. Oh, the other thing I wanna mention about this is just making sure that the customer, because you're often helping people, um, we often help people who already don't necessarily have an understanding of technology. One thing I do is I try to make sure that they understand you know, what the software is that we're downloading and exactly what it does that, you know, we're about to project your screen. Is there anything you want to hide you don't want people to see? And last, but certainly not least, um, one of the um, interesting tools that I found um, and actually that I've used is if um, I can't, if I'm using Google Chrome and I push F12, I can actually see different viewports because um, of like phone devices or mobile devices. I know that a lot of times websites will either have a responsive design so that on a smaller screen, it looks different. Or sometimes they even have an entirely different website designed for mobile devices. 
So this is something you can use if, you know, you can project their screen, but you can project your screen, but they can't project theirs. Or if you just kind of need a visual, if you're used to using the desk, seeing the desktop version of the site and you just need a visual, this is something really easy um, that you can use to get a visual to help kind of help walk that customer along. And they have lots of options in there for um, different types, all different sizes of de devices. And then if you just happen to know about the screen size and they don't necessarily have that device listed, then you can type in that screen size and it will adjust the site for you. And what you would do in that case, you just um, go to the site you want, push F12 and select the screen and it will already be that size for you. So in conclusion, I wanna um, say thanks to everybody for joining us here today again. And um, I hope that you discovered something that might make adapting to the new normal just a little bit easier. I know that as library professionals, um, continuing to kind of make internet and computer access equitable is very different right now, but our communities really appreciate what we do. And it's important for us to remember that, you know, a five-star rating for us, somebody being happy that we help them with technology, what it really means um, and what it translates to is really that, you know, someone got the job that they needed or, someone decided to stay in school instead of quitting out of frustration because they couldn't use a computer. Or even that maybe someone got that vaccine appointment that they didn't even understand how to sign up for since they have to do it online. If you would like to connect with me on LinkedIn, you are certainly welcome to do so. Um, it's linkedin.com slash IN slash Mary A. Guillory and Guillory spelled G-U-I-L-L-O-R-Y. Um, include a message so I know you're from here and not just a completely random person, but I'd be happy to connect with any of you. And thanks again. Thank and you. if they have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Well, um, thank you so much, Mary. My jaw is on the floor right now. I just, <laughs> wow. I mean, this is, these are the, the most simple ideas, but the, the execution is just incredible. Um, let me go up here and see. Oh, what are the reactions from patrons to the pointer? They are usually, they usually find it amusing and they, they say that I look like a warrior, <laughs> but they're happy for it because I can point them to where they need to be. Okay, let me just double check another question. What material did you use on your 3D printer that is soft? I use TPU. So um, as far as 3D printing goes for um, materials that might be readily available for people with the beginning of that technology, so FDM 3D printers, there's nylon and there's TPU. TPU is the easiest. Nylon kind of, um, it's hard to keep because it's really sensitive to moisture, but TPU, you can have it sitting on the shelf for a while um, and it is very flexible. It just takes altering the print settings a little bit. You have to print it a little slower, but um, it's nice and flexible for you. Okay, um, great info. My library admin and IT departments have always not allowed us any remote access software. Any tips for convincing them to change? I think now being that there is a pandemic, um, they may be more open. I found that even at my library, Things that we never thought would ever happen or ever get through are now going through very quickly and easily. So I think um, emphasizing the challenges that you're going through with the pandemic may help. Um, if they're really opposed to that still, um, I'm not sure. Maybe talking to them more about, well, what do they suggest if they're not gonna let you use certain remote access software or maybe even finding out exactly, trying to pinpoint exactly what is their concern with that remote access software so that maybe you can find a solution that won't cause that much concern for them. Yeah, it's always about what they're, it's so, they're so quick to say what we, why we can't do something. Let's, let's look at why we can do something. I think that's really important. That's right. Any website, any websites that are good resources for specific types of common training needs? Um, I know there is the, the Goodwill one that's out there. I think it's 
GF. I want to say GFC. I don't want to mess up the name. GF Learn Free. Yes, that one. GF yeah. Learn Free. Um, yeah. That's a good one. A lot of people have, well, depending on what your library has, um, a lot of us have universal class. We have um, really just going to YouTube a lot of times if they search for something, there'll usually be someone there that already has a video for it. Using um, Linda, if your library is now offering Linda or LinkedIn Learning, it's changed to places like that. Yeah, look at your state library. Um, yeah, for those kind of resources, we have those um, as well. Um, let me check. Thank you so much. Yeah, someone put a link into GFC, GCF Learn Free. Um, dot org. I have we link to that on the Library of Virginia website underneath um, self uh, self paced learning. Um, I'm looking for more questions. Don't see any except to say, wow, you know, um, I'm, I'm really impressed with what you talked about, and I know we all are as well. So, in closing. I wanna thank you again, Mary, for being here today and thank you everybody, everyone for attending our webinar. If you have any other questions, please do not hesitate to contact your state library's continuing education coordinator. Once you leave today's webinar, you will receive a survey on the presentation and we would appreciate it if you would complete that with your feedback. Links, any information shared and slides will be coming, um, will be coming to you with the recording within the week. Um, thanks all, and be sure to join us at three o'clock for our next concurrent sessions. I am a paraprofessional girl guy in a professional world and right size, not downsized, weeding for quality and not quantity. And this is the first day of a three-day conference and look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you very much and stay well. Bye everybody. <laughs>